there, I've actually discovered online there, are, there is more than one Kevin McNeely, so it's <laughs> kind of uncanny when that happens. Um, I'll just explain for a, a minute or two what we plan on doing, and then we'll do it. Um, essentially, uh, what uh, Nick and I have done is build a, um, a suite of poems out of the material in the book. Uh, each of the poems is uh, named after a trumpet player. This is all about trumpets in a certain sense. And uh, so as we go through, you'll hear me say uh, different kinds of names or nicknames, and that's just cueing you to the fact that we've moved on to someone else's voice. So uh, we've, got a, we've put together about nine or 10 of them uh, selected. I think there are 31 in the book itself. So uh, it, most of these people, some you'll recognize. I mean, Louis Armstrong is in there, but some you most likely will not. They are not particularly well known. And sometimes what the book's about is um, trying to figure out um, how you do or do not fit into history and how you talk about yourself and things like that. So uh, maybe if you're interested, we can talk a little bit about how it might work uh, after we've done the reading. So it's a suite we have that takes about uh, 15 or 20 minutes, and then we've got another piece after that, and that'll be it. Uh, but it'll move in one kind of continuous arc for a little while, just so you're prepared. I should introduce uh, Nick as well, just to tell you a little bit about him, because you got a, a spiel that I submitted, but I didn't realize I had put down all the things I was writing and publishing, so that was a lot. But um, anyway, uh, Nick is a percussionist from uh, around Vancouver and has done all kinds of things. I actually um, sort of uh, ran into him, really, uh, when I was doing a talk at the Vancouver International Song Institute uh, last summer, and uh, I had planned on uh, having a musician work with me uh, in our, uh, it, when the, we were gonna have the book launch for this particular collection, and I hadn't got it together. So two days before, I ran into Nick, and he said he was a percussionist, and I said, oh, do you wanna play? And he said, yeah, okay. And so uh, <laughs> we sort of did this on the fly, and it worked out. So this is really our second go at, uh, at uh, doing this kind of thing. So. Uh, Nick plays with Turning Point and other ensembles in town. You should check him out and see what he's doing because it's some really cool stuff. All right, so without any further ado. Actually, two, uh, one more ado. Uh, the, the <laughs> there is, the, as I said, it's a sequence named after each of the, uh, the trumpet players or the, the musicians, but the first piece is a kind of an overture or a little bit of an introductory, a prelude or a preface or something like that. So that's the first one. Do you know what an embouchure is? You can speak if you want to. Anyone know what that is? Yes. It's your, it's a, what is it? Brenda? Yeah, your mouth, exactly. Or a jazz musician would say your chops. So that's the, one of the first wor words in the, in the piece. But it's sort of the shape of your mouth and it kind of relates to your voice and how you play and things like that. So that's why the, the title of the book is what it is. All right. Embouchure. You get as good lip service as you give. Chops will ever out the fake. The put on line never cut grace notes from a sloppy wad of clams. Trued up, a well flubbed phrase ought to betray nothing more than lacquered horn, the schwa blat of hand polished open brass. Style takes care of its own. Chops make the rep. An off mouthpiece can cut you like shrapnel. Know the hard limits of your instrument and work its righteous edges. Be the pro. Then come the call. Let rip a proper lick. Commit. Buddy. What happened was he wigged out utterly before that big time Edison could wax him proper like. No sense fighting facts, race, music took nothing like priority. So, next best thing, try picturing brass Charles gussied to the nines for some street parade. That notorious cornet rubbed flashy. One sepia tintype survives the slow rot of nitrates, history's soft sizzle. 
And there he is, tuxed up with his band boys in front of a canvas drop cloth, ready to get outsized as horn folklore, the first. They said he could be heard 14 miles off. They said he always wore red undershirts. They said he drank. They said a lot of things. Some odd bits must be true. There lived a man whose name cut to the still quick left behind by imaginary one-off jams, bygones. Sheet music curls like peeling wallpaper, like the lapels of moth-eaten, overexposed suits, foxed to its legible edge. The preservation societies pretend to remake songs long since curdled to mute, the damaged stuff of dirt-clogged, melt-mucked grooves. But, truth to tell, each aftermath half in love with deadness, spreads its rancid butter like a blurred shadow on his plain brown toast. The dark backwards of unrecorded time. Freddy. When Bolden broke, Keppard came next along stepping up from the second line to lead, because he was so damned loud, anyhow. The blowhard with a lip like black wrought iron. Stuck near the stage, you leaned your chair way back or left before your ears started to bleed. What loose evidence there is says he did the first show tour, hauling his blared assets around all the out-city Orpheums. The white originals, Jelly Roll said, watered down Freddy's best licks in upscale saloons, cutting the earliest shellacs that God called jazz, stretching out history. So he knew records were a cheat for thieves or copycats and blew Victor off cold. A few years on, chops, Starting to go soft, he thought better, or maybe didn't care. In Chicago with Dodds, he waxed classic, a half a dozen tracks in 26 for Paramount. Even in limp mono, those late takes touch, the puckered nevermore that throbs by strut or stomp from his lost wail. King. Scratchy 78s of Joe and Jelly Roll, a few legit but most bootlegged, survived the back and forth tirades over who played jazz first. Neither one did, or both, Lord knows. In those duos, you get the rank of ya the yank <laughs> of rag, the deep counter tug of Dixie on stride, flaring out from a wash of background noise. Self-invested, the shuffle-stop monarch, he blew to beat the band, his own. Louis listened and learned. When Louisiana turned sour like home-cooked corn mash, they went north and took down Chicago, where Pops dropped out, and then New York. The speakeasies were packed for every date. Tills jingled. Glasses clinked, spirits poured forth, distilling history. Bix. The legend of the young man with a horn stems from him. That slicker-haired, pasty-faced, tuxedoed and beardless boy in the front row of the picks of Whiteman's lame brain band. He played his parts, 
No one knows where talent like his blows in from. It surges, happens. He drifted through in a mist with a deft sixth sense such as you'd never heard the like. And all the while tanked to the gills, a freaking miracle of alcoholic bliss. He practically drunk himself down into oblivion and fame at the same time, dead by 28. The Sioux City Six, the Wolverines, the rhythm jugglers, gigs with Trumbauer. He tooted along, sight reading pretentious, uninspired charts, earfuls of skunky schlock, the called for novelty numbers and classical jazz. But when he cut loose from his eight allotted bars, no matter what dead weight he'd been carrying, the song took flight, an eloquence of fragrant vowels and crisp June nights, like bourbon when it's chilled. Prof Rolini chuffed along underneath, hoisting him on thick cushions of bass notes, but Bix never fell back. The man-child played too well. He swung hell-bent for grief, told them all off. I may be pale, but oh, my soul is dark. Heebie-jeebies, Louie, take two. Some get the heebie-jeebies every time the needle reaches this one hot five track, a black shellacked pearl of no greater price, blowing sine qua non. What makes it jazz cuts through scratches and lint, the shredded veil of pasts impossible to catch, except in muffled surface noise. The records, the record horn's blurred voice, a dull tremble, rough sound, essence. Fumbled leads, ubi scat, and pig Latin aren't just mistakes, they make their own music. Accidentals become the very thing, a moment's monument, maybe. A flub that in its awkward grace takes hold of time's throat and rips it wide open. Them huffing along at two beats to the bar tear holes in the air with their diamond notes. And again, some don't hear it. And who's to say, if you have to ask, you don't need to know. Mew, she hooked up with smack on a riverboat. He liked her licks, and she be believed he looked okay for a musician. She'd had one already, one too many, if you'd asked. She'd made her mark with the spillers in vaudeville and paid her dues. An all-vamp vampire band came next, but she was still too straight to jazz until Louis showed her the shining path. And just when things started to cook, along comes love, meaning the second trumpet subs, girl Friday, gopher, and a nursemaid, wife for half the band. The sad truth was, she could rip them to shreds with one or two choice lines, but never got the chance to strut her stuff. Bunk said he had two years on Buddy, a fib, if ever one was heard. He played second in Bolden's band, though, sure enough. The bunk speaks for itself he liked to say, winking. 
and almost wasn't recorded at all, a relic of his music's blotted birth. Till later, when they revived the lost style and fitted his face with a set of teeth. Then you should have heard him. Tone never lies. You might flub your way through some ditzy tune for the old folks' sake, but if you can't cut it, you're on your ear. The rote's been rewritten so many ways we all get left behind. But when Bunk stood upstage to take a bow, dentures gleaming like the bell of his boss horn, no more the syncopated dud throwback, those people knew they had been told some truth for one last time before the times were changed. Muggsy, had it good once, better. The great 16 sides of Dixie cut back in the first and only true revival. Swing was trash, a dance hall sellout. The pure, raggy howl of corny brass against dark clarinets made even more sense second time around. And then the needle skipped and something stuck. If you find a groove, might as well keep to it. Francis, you got pinned to your own big legend, the king of Nixieland, the pretender. You turned into your own worst parody, a comeback kid who never could get wise. Repeat, repeat, reprise, reprise. Reprise. Cat. Came on at the tail end of the big war. Last of the real blasters. Finesse never his strong suit. He could roll and roar a line whenever Duke let him out of his cage, the eight or 16 bars he was allowed. Like a panther, he hung back and then pounced when least you expected. Cootie got mad after all the top end leads fell cat's way and he threatened to quit, but never did. El Gato thought every half-lipped player ought to learn how to cruise the stratosphere a couple octaves up. Make yourself heard. Blow hard. Blow high. Blow loud. But blow, man, blow! That's on the show. <laughs> We're good. So there's more, but it would take a long time to read that book. So <laughs> um, uh, we have uh, one more piece, and we actually uh, worked out, and um, we actually did this at uh, the other Robson reading we did in June as well. And um, Nick was really nice about this because um, I said while we were standing up in front reading, "Do you want to try this?" And he said, "Okay." So uh, it was kind of made up. Uh, so we've kind of come back to it and because I thought it turned out great that time. So we'll see. Um, this is called Ayaf Yala Yo, Ayaf, I can't say it. Ayaf Yala Yo Kul. Do you know what that is? Anybody speak Icelandic? No, I don't. <laughs> uh, in uh, April 2010, there was a volcano in Iceland that exploded and it shut down the airlines and over Europe and North America for um, what, about a week or so, wasn't it? So um, that's the name of the volcano, and it was in the, in the press and uh, a lot and on TV, and uh, nobody could say the name, and, uh, which was kind of cool. I thought, kind of interesting. No one could pronounce this. Like, I was practicing before today, too. Ayaf yalayokul, so I can say it, sort of. That's fake Icelandic, though. I don't really know. 
But no one could say it, so they kept calling it the Icelandic volcano, the volcano in Iceland, <laughs> and things like this. And it became a kind of a thing, like this unpronounceable name that no one could say. And I really like this idea of the unspeakable, like you can't say it, and it shut down half the world in a way, and you can't say its name, and so on. Um, I was also interested, I, uh, been, I've taught Old English poetry and things like that in different capacities over the years. And in that kind of form, there is a, a sort of a, an insult contest that uh, is conventional and um, in Icelandic poetic forms, Old Icelandic as well as Old English and Anglo-Saxon forms and things like that. Uh, uh, some, sometimes it's called flighting, which is like a boast contest or where you sort of call each other names. And I thought it might be interesting to call the volcano some names because you can't name it. So this is a, a sort of an extended name calling session uh, written in the, some kind of form that's vaguely like it might have been recognizable to an Icelandic volcano. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to give it a go, okay? Ayaf Yala Yokul. Here we go. You unspeakable ash chuffer, chunk blower, sky smasher, flint chucker, you god thumper, air mucker, muckraker, earth breaker, shield shifter, punk. Pre-Cambrian side splitter. You peak breaker, plate chewer, magma pumper, cinder spitter, rock snapper, dirt scorcher, thunder spewer, boulder melter, pyroclastic vent popper. You fossil dissolver, pumice flinger, basalt blaster, shale burner, crater cracker, Sand thrasher, cloud glazer, you sun shrouder, moon blocker, star blunter, crust exploder, heat coffer, you blatantly igneous eviscerator, you plume puffer, cone heaper, slag piler, lava dribbler, wind clogger, mantle crumbler, Hadian expectorator, you indifferent, indecent, ingrown incinerator. You fisher cutter, home wrecker. You heaven blotter. You world scrambler. Nicholas. Nicholas, Nicholas shot. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Steve. That was awesome. <laughs> cool. So I'm supposed to answer questions if you have them. Or you can read something else. But <laughs> is that right, Alan? I just, is this cool? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Elise, hi. Hi. Um, Kevin, do you know so much about jazz probably because you play it yourself? Uh, well, uh, you have a copy of the book now, I think. Yes. So you may know that there's an essay in there confessing <laughs> this, or you may not have got to it yet. <laughs> well, it kind of got tucked in there anyway, because it's, it, cause, um, I, I, it's a, like a complicated answer to a simple question, because the right answer would be no, because uh, I really suck, right? <laughs> I'm like a, a closet trumpet player. Like, I have a couple, and... Um, they're kind of uh, out of practice. My chops are down, as they say, but I don't really have any chops. I'm happy so, that's where that word comes from. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, yeah, I, I don't know who would have originated. I mean, like a lot of these things, it sort of emerges out of that. But it kind of means like your chops is like, it, it's kind of come to mean how well you can play if you have technique, like you got good chops or something like that. But actually, like it's your, your jaw and your, the shape of your mouth. I really like that idea too, because it, um, it sort of connects to thinking about voice. You know, I'm quite interested in voice in poetry and other kinds of writing. So the point of the essay is kind of to confess that I can't play. <laughs> but to talk about why I'm fascinated with this music, because uh, it's been with me a long time, like I've been listening to it and collecting it. You know, this is my wife, Christina, <laughs> that uh, I have a big ungainly record collection, so it takes up too much space. So I've been listening to it for a long time. So uh, yeah, but I don't know, I try to play it. Everybody tries to, but it's, it's pretty tough. I mean, to be able to do those kinds of things, it takes a lot of work, so. So no, but I like trumpets a lot, lately, anyway. Hey, Brenda. I, I really like the, um, 
combination of percussion with your poems. And I'm curious to know how you develop. Is it completely improvisation on percussionist part, or did you actually seek inspiration from some of the music of the musicians you're speaking about, or how, how did that all work out? Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that too? Well, oh, um, go ahead. Yeah. We could both talk about we'll it. We'll both. I mean, <clears throat> just like what you've done. I, I, th I think our process mostly for coming up with the collaboration was to look at the poems and then try to set um, some limitations on the percussion in terms of a sound concept to complement them. We try textures and different yeah, kinds of things. Yeah. We try not to go back to sort of the original subject matter of the music too much as an influence. There was a kind of a shuffle in there a couple times, you know, yeah. like, sh -sh -sh -sh, a little bit and stuff like that. Yeah, so. I mean, some, some rhythmic games for sure. But. Yeah, but uh, yeah, for me it's interesting to kind of stay away from idiom in a way and try and see what happens. Um, I did another version of some other poems with this with a, a horn player I actually really admire named uh, Taylor Ho Bynum. He's a trumpet player. And he was nice enough to agree to collaborate at one point. And it's like, these are trumpet poems. So he's like, OK. And, uh, but uh, he was really conscious of not imitating the, the sound of the players directly, necessarily. But he was really echoing it, I think, too. So it's like you were saying, there's kind of a, I mean, these aren't percussionists exactly, but there's a lot of percussive language in there, I think. Yes, so they're kind of echoes and connections. But then it breaks apart, I think, too, and goes its own ways. So it's a, sort of a combination. Yeah, at, when you were in full, you know, I don't know, form there, I felt like <laughs> you needed a dancer as well. Oh, really? <laughs> I could have tried, I guess. <laughs> it's like my trumpet playing, you know. <laughs> That's obviously what we're missing as a dancer. We can, well, maybe next time. <laughs> And it's, this is, I mean, we also, I don't think it's any shame to say this was a kind of an on-the-fly collaboration to start with. It just kind of happened. And I felt, I, hopefully Nick felt this way too, but I felt like it kind of worked out really well. So we wanted to try it again. So that's, that's where it came from. But our rehearsals are a little, we didn't have very many, and it's just sporadic, you know, that way. It, it keeps it fresh too, I guess. It's good, yeah. It's good that way. Did you have a question? Um, this is my only exposure to the poetry, so I don't have a collection, but you mentioned history, and it sounds like excavating perhaps the forgotten voices of these trumpet players as part of your um, mission. Yeah. Uh, and I was wondering how you conceptualize your role given your um, placement in time right now. Right. Perspective and your voice, I guess, and how uh, you conceptualize that. Yeah. Sort of, uh, liberating perhaps even within um, swept under the carpet. That's the issue in a lot of the pieces, I think, is um, sort of loss, like they disappear and come back and disappear again. Um, even when they, there are recordings, and a number of these writers, or a number of these uh, musicians were also writers. They produced history books, autobiographies, textbooks, and a lot of this material that I drew on also sort of circulates in stories, uh, like um, that one, the piece in, at the end of the Louis Armstrong piece, Heebie Jeebies, where he says, if you have to ask, you don't need to know. It's a famous kind of quotation. Someone asked him, a, a young woman apparently asked him, what's jazz, Mr. Armstrong? And he said, if you have to ask, you don't need to know. But there's no place where that is actually in print, having him say it. It's just legend. So um, like in recovering these voices, it's like you're, uh, I feel like I'm trying to sort of touch on things that are a little bit uh, ephemeral. They sort of disappear. You know, and the, the sort of fate of the, their language is the same thing in many ways as their fate in uh, kind of music fame. Some of them, like Louis Armstrong, are, remain quite famous. And he's a sort of a touchstone for a lot of these horn players as well. But um, say, um, Mew Henderson, I read a poem called Mew. Uh, she's, uh, I mean, she just ended up, as far as I know, just not be, being able to play because she's married to Fletcher Henderson. His nickname was Smack, that's what, how that started. But um, who was a, a big band leader in uh, the 30s. And uh, just, um, it's, it's as if she kind of got swept up because she's a woman, among other things, in, uh, in other people's music. And then her own voice, and apparently she's like a, a, just a wicked trumpet player, but just kind of gets, dis disappears. So it's, it's interesting to me. I mean, this is a complicated question, it turns out, and there are a lot of things to say. But for me, it's interesting as a kind of outsider, as someone who comes late, as a listener, not a player exactly, as someone who is racially and sometimes by gender and certainly by culture um, separated from the world that these people variously, I mean, it's different, different worlds in a way, but the worlds that they inhabited. But that separation really interests me. Um, because uh, I know from the time I was a teenager, I felt like this was my music, too. And so that suggests something about how I 
want to conceptualize my voice. If I hear myself somehow echoed in that, and yet it's a music from somewhere else and from other people, how does that identification happen? So I, I don't think I want to claim that I made my voice out of theirs, because that's tricky, but I feel like I want to say I made, tried to make my own sense of a voice out of that problem, right? that it's always a problem, it's always an issue to try and speak through someone else's words in a way, or try and take words onto your own page and, and try to con reconstruct yourself out of them. I mean, these are all poems about other people. And they're also all historical people. They all really existed. I think they're all past now. They all really existed. So there's a, it's a, a, a kind of an interesting dynamic to try and think about the ways in which a life becomes historical and becomes public domain in a way. It becomes shared property and how you take up those voices again. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's part of the process. It's a little bit like recovering them, but um, it's kind of impossible to recover them, too, and that impossibility really interests me. I think that's the best way to say it. Okay, and I was also going to ask about your research, and you just answered that wonderfully, but uh, one thing I love about the poems is how you um, get a sense of their struggles in there, the struggle they had in that society, right. but also their strengths, you know, flow, you know. Yeah, they just they persist despite it all. There's there's some valuing of their their sound. Usually they they will in different capacities say that that all that matters is that I had a sound that I, it was me somehow it was out there. And music's very ephemeral. I mean, texts like this are printed on the page. And uh, I mean, Nick was improvising largely, but um, I had a script, and so I did a few flubs and I missed a few things. But basically, I stuck to my script. So um, there's something about that improvised moment that uh, disappears. Um, the musician Eric Dolphy, I don't know if you know him, is a saxophone bass clarinet player from the 60s, really. And uh, he's famously quoted as saying, once you've played a note, they're out there in the air, they're gone. That's it. And now there's, there are recordings of him saying that, so it's obviously a little bit of a paradox when it's recorded. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, there is this sense of this kind of disappearance of history sort of absorbing you and of, uh, you kind of fading into that that accompanies the improvised performance. It's very temporary, very ephemeral. And yet, it, it seems to happen, and it can often have a, a really powerful moment to it, a sort of an, uh, a monumentality in a weird way. So that's, that, I, I don't know if, I, I'm just sort of talking around what you asked, but that's sort of, it's again, it's this kind of um, tension that I feel like I'm drawn to repeatedly between something stable and something inherently not something about loss and preservation kind of coupled at the same time. No, you suggest the improvisatory, but I think you also have preserved them in, 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 a, in a different Right. Way. Some of the, um, like the band names, it is in New Orleans, it means the preservation hall is what they call it. So you can sort of, you can, it's a nice thing about words, you can take their names and their bands and things like that and make them resonate, make them do work that they weren't necessarily intended to do. So there is some of that in that, absolutely, right? to play, but to preserve at the same time, yeah. Cool, I'm gonna use that now, at least. That's smart. <laughs> Maybe just because you're performing with Nick, but there's a real rhythm to a lot of what you're saying. <clears throat> is that how it's written, or is that a performance? Um, this is, like, you're gonna find out all my secrets. Uh, where's a copy of the? So if you, this is just a page off the proof, but you, um, the poems are all in the same kind of, uh, they look the same on the page, basically, for this sequence. I mean, I have other forms, but <laughs> these ones. So they, they're kind of, uh, they look a little bit raggedy. Uh, but in fact, um, they're, they're actually written in a, a, a sort of a cyclical four, it looks like a four-line pattern. It's actually a two-line pattern. That I'm a syllable counter. I'm like hugely formal. So they have ten syllables each, each of the two lines. Uh, but they fracture and break in odd ways. So that's what I was trying to get at. I mean, I don't know if this works or not. It's just what happened this time. And I was thinking, oh, don't tell me about your form. You know, <laughs> who wants to know that? But you're, you're sort of, uh, this has to do with like there being a fixed structure and then a kind of fractured or uh, kind of broken opening, uh, breaking open inside that structure. So that's, that's how I think of it, at least. I mean, the, the kind of rhythm, language rhythm, tends to be a bit elastic. So it's, it's and I like working with syllables and syllabics rather than accents, because English tends to, sort of work with accent. So if you work in syllabics, you're gonna count things in weird ways and it's going to break the rhythm in, in funny ways. Even though it's strict, you can't quite hear the syllable count, in other words. You can often hear accents. So it's gonna sound like it's free, but then it's gonna have this really fixed, rigorous structure somewhere underneath it. So um, is that kind of what you're asking? Like, it, that's how I like to work is sort of, not to, that's why I said I'm kind of 
letting you see my secrets because I like to hide the, hide the formal part because it always seems to me like if you get too overtly formal, um, it can get a little staid for me sometimes, you know, that it just seems very fixed. So I, I like to kind of break it up and see what happens. So working in something that's really fixed but also doesn't let itself happen that way. Seemed to me to be, a, that's kind of how early jazz sometimes worked too, where you have a, a really fixed conventional form, you know, uh, in, you know, you can imagine any of this kind of Dixieland sounding stuff, what it would sound like. But then inside of that, you have a lot of freedom. So that, that's sort of what I was trying to get at. So now, I don't know how, what, how Nick reacted to this. We talked a little bit about, there was one piece uh, about Muggsy Spanier, Francis Spanier, which, which um, he used, you used a kind of five beat figure, didn't you, wasn't it? So yeah. this is like 10 to 5 sort of thing. Yeah, like a 5, like a repeating 5 note pattern. Yeah, so it's sort of structure. You kind of pick that up out of the uh, see if we can make this slap. Out of the poems. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. But it's, uh, th I think we're a little at odds with each other sometimes, and then it kind of locks in and out. Uh, that's how I like it, I think. So, but in a good way. I don't mean yeah, in a bad no, way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Alan. I'm always fascinated how a writer <coughs> owns his craft um, to Canada. I hear writers uh, like writing late into the night, uh, writing in the bath, writing in the dark. <laughs> in the bath. How, how, do you, how do you approach your craft? Uh, and particularly with a busy schedule, teaching and marketing. And family. How do, you, how, do you, how do you fit everything in? How do you write? Uh, it changes. So, but um, I think if I were to say, um, I, uh, one of the, uh, the reason I, I like lyric poetry is, I mean, this is an extended piece, <clears throat> but it started off as one poem that appeared, it's one of the Louis Armstrong poems that appeared in a, a journal about 15 or so years ago, I won't say, <laughs> it was a while ago, uh, and then that got recrafted. Uh, so um, I felt like I was able to work, it is in this kind of unit, unitary sort of serial form because I was able to work one unit at a time because that's the amount of time I have. If I'm going to write, I kind of get fixated sometimes. It's a little, Christina knows because I'm kind of grouchy when I'm writing, but <laughs> it's because I'm trying to, you know, I got so much time I'm trying to finish this one, at least in some form, finish a draft of some piece and then move on. And if I haven't quite got to the end of it, I'm like, oh, I don't know, it's something I feel bad about something. So um, it's like I, I have I guess it's my emotional life now that's coming from the front. But I have a certain amount of time that it's, uh, enables me to kind of get something out. So that's like a page and a half or something like that. I don't know. It could be anything. But just a shorter form. Uh, and then compiling those into a longer sequence. It just sort of happened. But it wasn't conceived of as a sustained work. So my writing pattern is usually very in bursts. I work in bursts. And, uh, yeah. In the evolution of yeah. ideas over the years. Yeah, it took a few years to put this together. And it was actually, um, I, have, I have some other pieces that are you know, at a publisher now waiting to get a, the yes or no. But uh, this was sort of appended as a, a little shorter sequence as, uh, to that other manuscript. So it was like this was kind of connected to it. But then um, some people who had read it suggested, why don't you just separate it and uh, make it into a book. And so I did, and I sent it off that way. And I added the essay to maybe flesh it out a little. And uh, yeah, they took it that way. So, um, by the way, I should thank my publisher, Silas White, of Nightwood Editions. They're excellent. So Nightwood's a really great publisher, and I'm really thankful that they have published this book. It's really great. Uh, so that's how that kind of happened. It sort of, it, it, it's not exactly evolving, but it gradually got cut and rearranged and, and built up until it shaped itself into this. Yeah, but it was a while. <laughs> I worked too slowly in bursts. All right, well, if there's nothing else, thank you. Thanks very much for coming out, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Nicholas. Please.